Good afternoon, everyone. We are now resuming the fifth Oxford Arbitration Day. I am Ana Carolina Dallagnol, one of the co-organizers of the event. It is a great pleasure to, to have you here. And we are now kicking off the afternoon sessions, but not before we thank our sponsors and our supporters for making this event possible. Thank you very much for, you, for your support. Um, this is panel three, which will address arbitration and failure to perform due to the pandemics. And now um, I'm connecting with Guilherme Hisena Costa, who will be the moderator of this session. He is part of the International Dispute Resolution Group of the Bevois and Plimpton, and he specializes in commercial and investment arbitration. Guilherme, thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Ana Carolina. Um, can everybody hear me? Just see me and hear me. My experience shows that that's the question one should ask when doing these things. Um, but thank you so much. It is a real great pleasure to be moderating our next panel. We have a really uh, unique and a high caliber lineup. Um, first off, we have Isabel Michou of Quinn Emanuel in Paris. She handles not only complex commercial and investment arbitration, but also litigation in the French courts and she's dual qualified as both a French uh, avocat and an English solicitor. We have Catalina Monteiro Pires, um, a partner at Moraes Leiton in Lisbon. She currently works chiefly as an arbitrator and a legal expert with a special focus on loserphone jurisdictions, and she teaches at the University of Lisbon both international commercial law and the law of obligations. And to wrap up, we have Naomi uh, Beercliffe, who's counsel with Allen and Overy in London. She too has extensive experience in both investment and commercial arbitration, and she does a lot of public international law too. So our panelists today are gonna talk about COVID and non-performance of contractual obligations. But let me just preface that with some very brief introductory remarks. The global pandemic, as we know, is pretty much unlike anything in our recent memory. Um, as are the disruptions that it's caused to supply chains, to, to all sorts of things in our lives. Um, having really sort of turned our lives upside down, it has thrown into stark relief how contracting parties' assumptions as to future states of the world can fail, and can fail quite dramatically, actually. And that, of course, calls into question the obligations that are entered into on the basis of those assumptions. But before we get carried away with non-performance, it's perhaps just worth remembering very quickly that obligations imposed by contract are in principle absolute. And despite their differences, most legal systems seek to enforce the party's bargain either through an award of damages or specific performance. Uh, in some quite memorable uh, wording of the Seventh Circuit here in the US, a deal's a deal. And as I think our panel is gonna show today, um, excusing performance is still rather exceptional. And that, in fact, makes it all the more important to understand the various manners in which the law softens the harshness of the absolute contractual uh, nature of obligations. And that ranges from the many ways in which the parties themselves can choose to qualify obligations to a host of fairness and sort of equity-based doctrines that can apply, depending on the legal system, either, either through choice of the parties or as default provisions. And so while most of those doctrines are actually fairly well established, and I guess one of the overarching questions for us today is whether the contract issues that COVID poses are really novel in one way or not. Um, the, the fact is that across uh, legal systems, they are many and they are varied. So the list is pretty extensive across jurisdictions. We have impossibility, impracticability, frustration, force majeure, hardship, imprevision, excessive honorizadaji, and so on. And Moreover, even within any one jurisdiction, it's possible that the application of such doctrines might actually vary depending on whether you're in court or before an arbitral tribunal. So there's both a lot of commonality of purpose, uh, but also divergence of means that we can explore with our panel today. 
And it's precisely that approach that we have uh, chosen to, to take, really. Because of the very richly diverse legal background of our panelists, what we've decided to do is talk about three topics that we think will showcase some differences across legal systems, including how COVID-related disputes are playing out in, in various jurisdictions, and as a result, what parties who are engaged in international commerce and transactions should be aware of. The, the first topic we're going to talk about is force majeure, whether as a statutory legal doctrine, as it's recognized in most civil law uh, jurisdictions, or the somewhat sort of loose term that's used under English law and other common law systems to simply designate a class of contractual provisions for risk allocation. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about material adverse change or material adverse effect clauses, MAC clauses, whether in the context of M&A transactions as a condition of closing or uh, you know, acceleration clauses, say, in, in financing arrangements. And, and lastly, we're going to talk about hardship doctrines more generally, which, of course, can take a lot of forms in various civil law jurisdictions, uh, have somewhat of a lesser role in the common law tradition. But there is the you know, somewhat analogous uh, English law concept of frustration. And for those of us who practice in the US, there's the doctrine of impracticability. So to make the most of that, the way we've decided to conduct our panel is a roundtable format. Uh, and because of that, we would like to encourage everybody in the audience to participate very actively and not just at the end, but throughout by submitting questions really in real time. And as your moderator for today, I will do my absolute best to uh, interject with those questions as appropriately as I can to our panelists. Um, one just final note on procedure is that we're going to try to engage in as candid a debate as possible. But of course, the views and opinions of our panelists are you know, views and opinions in this sort of academic setting, and they don't necessarily reflect any personal views or views of their law firms. Um, with that disclaimer, and having already spoken a little bit too much, without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Isabel Michou to kick us off with some thoughts on force majeure. Yes, thank you very much. And I was uh, just trying to, to get uh, some technical issues uh, fixed, but I'm not sure uh, that that is done. Uh, can you hear me well now? I can hear you quite well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, first, um, I, I was asking to talk about Fox Major and Differential. So uh, I should probably uh, give you two key points by way of uh, introduction. First, uh, we are not, I'm not going to talk about uh, French law uh, 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 only applicable to France. Uh, what you should know is that um, uh, the French law that I'm going uh, I'm going to talk about uh, extends to other jurisdictions where um, the legal system is based on the French code Napoleon. Um, and and um, th this is the case uh, of um, North Africa uh, countries such as Algeria, Egypt, Libya, uh, Morocco, Tunisia. Uh, that's also the case for Francophone sub-Saharan African uh, countries such as RGC, uh, Senegal, Cameroon, Mali, and many others. They are based on French law and, of course, Sometimes you've got also a combination with Sharia law and Ohada law, but the, those uh, legal systems are based on uh, the French code Napoleon. So that's the first point by way of introduction. The second one is that uh, uh, in France, until recently, um, the legal definition and the conditions of force majeure were uh, based on case law. Uh, in 2016, there was a major reform of uh, contract law, and uh, the definition and the conditions of Fox Majeure uh, were incorporated into the civil code. And uh, I, I should start with the legal definition, which is now incorporated in the uh, civil code, which is Article 12, 18. And the, defini the definition goes like this. In a contract, uh, box measure occurs when first, an event beyond the control of the debtor, two, that could not have been reasonably foreseen at the time of the conclusion of the contract, and three, 
whose effects could not have been avoided by taking appropriate measures prevents performance of the debtor's obligation. That's the definition which is now incorporated into Article 1218 of the Civil Code. And that was pretty much the same thing in the case law before 2016. That definition is not of mandatory nature. That means two things. First, the parties can deviate from this legal definition in their contract, and two, they can even exclude the force measure uh, uh, from uh, their contract. That's the first thing about the legal uh, definition. So if we look at the specific features under French law, uh, and that would be most likely the same in the other jurisdictions uh, that I mentioned earlier, the first is for a force majeure to, to occur, you need an event which is beyond the control of the party invoking uh, the force majeure. Uh, very often, if you have a clause uh, of force majeure in your contract, you will probably have a list of events that would qualify as force majeure. Very often, it's not limited. It's only uh, a, a, a list of some events that can qualify as force majeure, but it's not a limited uh, list. The second feature is that that event, in order to qualify as force majeure, um, could not have been reasonably foreseen at the time of the conclusion of the contract. And that is important because, of course, any court or arbitral uh, tribunal applying French law or something which is based on French, uh, French law would assess that uh, by looking at the, the party's background at the time of the conclusion of the contract, by looking at the party's expertise, uh, expertise at the time of the conclusion of the contract, and then the event itself uh, would be looked at um, as um, what was considered as not reasonably foreseeable uh, or foreseen at the time of the conclusion of the contract. The third feature of a uh, force majeure uh, is that the event must render performance of the contract impossible. And that is important because if performance of the contract is possible, but simply more difficult or more onerous, then that's not force majeure. It is arguably something else, and we'll talk about this a bit later. It could be hardship or something else. So uh, the, the, the standard is very high. It must be uh, impossible to perform uh, the contract. And then uh, the event uh, could uh, not have been avoided by taking appropriate measures. Uh, that is uh, another point that needs to be uh, taken uh, into account. Uh, but because, of course, if uh, the debtor um, was able to find an alternative supplier, then the force majeure would not be characterized in these uh, specific uh, uh, circumstances. And again, a court or an arbitral tribunal would look at what the competition uh, did. For instance, were the competitors able to, um, to perform uh, the contract? So those are the uh, specific features of force measure under uh, French law. Now, what I should say uh, uh, is also the effects of force measure once you have an event that would uh, qualify as force majeure. And here the effects can be um, either temporary, and if that is uh, the case, then the performance of the contract will only be suspended. And of course, if the force majeure goes on longer, then at some point there may be a right to terminate the contract. But if the force majeure is permanent from day one, then that gives right automatically to a right to terminate the contract. And the automatically is quite important because that is really by operation of uh, the law. I think that I will stop here about the um, legal definition of and conditions or specific features of force majeure under French law.
and we may come back uh, to uh, those particular uh, definition and features uh, later on if there are any questions on this. Oh, great, thank you, Isabel. Um, <clears throat> Catarina, can you tell us a little bit how Portuguese and other Lusophone jurisdictions, uh, how, how Portugal and other Lusophone jurisdictions might differ from this French sort of background that Isabel has presented to us? Um, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organization for the invitation and to congratulate André, Philippe, Anne and Joan. Uh, for this year's edition of the Oxford Arbitration Day. And it is also an honor to share this panel with, with Guy, with Naomi and with Isabel. Thank you all for, for this opportunity. Uh, well, um, uh, my first word is um, to say that we are here to discuss very complex matters. We all know that in long-term contracts, particularly in construction and industrial contracts, failure to perform is often triggered by multiple causes. And at the same time, the world is still struggling with millions of COVID-19 cases and Europe is facing a new round of shutdowns. And we as arbitrators, as lawyers and as legal experts are dealing with new cases and sometimes with old cases requiring new answers. We have to be able to think on our feet. So what can we do? I think that comparative law is a very important tool to cope with new challenges. And if we accept this, to understand the problems related to force majeure in civil law jurisdictions other than the French law, we have to step back and to, uh, to try to draw some, con some distinctions. And the first one concerns the difference between jurisdictions that follow the German tradition and other jurisdictions that do not follow such tradition. Uh, if we look at the, the Lusophone world, Portugal, Angola and Mozambique, uh, influenced by, by the German model, have civil codes setting for general and extensive regulation about impossibility to perform. And the reason is quite simple. In these countries, the creditors prefer remedy against breach of contract is primary performance, that is to say, uh, performance in specie of the contractual obligation. And therefore, impossibility to perform, which suspends or excludes claims for performance, is conceived as the most important limit on performance. And the same applies, of course, to supervenient illegality. Well, in these jurisdictions, there is no specific legal provision providing the definition of force majeure, nor setting a procedure to be followed, nor even referring to time limits to be observed. Force majeure is regarded as a mere type of impossibility to perform, a temporary impossibility not attributable to the parties. The consequences of uh, temporary impossibility are also clear in those systems. On the one hand, suspension of performance. On the other hand, suspension of counter-performance. And this is the starting point. Uh, nevertheless, in, in several civil law jurisdictions, uh, the parties' uh, contractual duties are not strict and therefore Lack of fault can also be used as an excuse, and in this context, force majeure can also be seen as an exemption of liability. I have been using the term temporary impossibility, but uh, we should note that in case of lease agreements, lockdown may be a cause of partial impossibility, causing uh, uh, the reduction of performance and the reduction of counter-performance. And this qualification, the qualification of a partial impossibility, derives from the nature of the agreement itself, implying units of time. I have recently read that the Court of Rome ruled on an interim relief application brought by a commercial tenant seeking to be discharged from its obligation to pay the rent. 
and the court decided that the tenant was entitled to a reduction of the rent, considering that the shops were closed by governmental decision. So the court decided that the landlord's obligations to provide a premise fit for the purpose, and the purpose was commercial activity, was partially impossible, and therefore the rent had to be reduced proportionally. Now, turning our attention to the other jurisdictions, to the jurisdictions that do not follow the German model, uh, the Brazilian example immediately uh, springs to mind. In Brazil, we find individual provisions scattered in the general and in the special part of the civil code, but we cannot find a central regime of impossibility to perform. Then, uh, then there's an article, Article 393, uh, that addresses the effects of force majeure, determining that such events uh, exempt the debtor from liability. Uh, well, the question now is, what about uh, common aspects? Well, I, I would say that many uh, civil law jurisdictions recognize that impossibility is only absolute impossibility in which a party cannot perform. So situations where performance becomes more difficult or less profitable are not impossibility cases. Uh, I think that this is the main view. Uh, uh, differently, the German civil code now recognizes a new doctrine of disproportion between the, the creditors' interests and the debtors' efforts. We do not know uh, if this, uh, this, uh, this, this doctrine this German doctrine that was uh, that was uh, introduced in the German civil code in 2001 is going to produce uh, any impact on 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 Lusophone or in other on on other civil uh, law uh, jurisdictions. Um, in this uh, jurisdiction, um, uh, force majeure uh, clauses, of course, play a, a very different role compared to uh, to, uh, to to the Anglo-Saxon uh, world. Uh, the parties cannot agree that the debtor is obliged to perform what is impossible, of course, but they can agree on the consequences of a force majeure event. The parties can take their own choices as to termination of contract, suspension of performance, and also, very important, regarding allocation of costs. In several civil law countries, a complex problem to deal with uh, in the absence of a detailed force majeure clause, clause uh, uh, concerns um, uh, seriousness of the delay for the purposes of termination of contracts. Uh, when can we say that the waiting period became too long or too, too burdensome? The answer in many civil law countries is unclear. It is therefore advisable to include a clause in the contract advising this, addressing these, uh, these, these issues and leaving uh, less room for maneuver. Otherwise, um, uh, courts may apply and tribunals may apply general criteria such as good faith to find an adequate solution. Uh, a final word uh, regarding um, uh, uh, the relationship between take or pay clauses and force majeure in also in the lusophone world. There is a recent court decision in Brazil about the impact of a force majeure clause on a take or pay obligation. The court considered that a lockdown of many activities could be qualified as a force majeure event affecting the purchase of energy. Um, I'm bringing this case because I believe that uh, similar cases may appear in the future in civil in civil law jurisdictions. Um, I think that's that's it. We can we can discuss these issues later on. Um, um, Guilherme. Katarina. Naomi, so you know we've seen a lot of sophistication around the 
doctrinal aspects of force majeure in civil law countries, obviously because it's statutory over there. Uh, how, how does it play out in England? Um, well, I think I could be quite brief on this. And as you allude, because as you alluded to in your um, introduction, we don't have a sort of doctrine of force majeure. And as it were, there's no free concept, freestanding concept of force majeure in English law. Um, there's just the contract. Um, in English law, um, the contract is king, the party's bargain is king. And um, when we're talking about force majeure, we're talking about a specific type of clause that parties tend to include in their contracts. Um, and what we call force majeure clauses are generally called clauses which describe themselves as such. Um, and they set out what should happen under the contract on the occasion of an event which is outside of party's control which may not amount to frustration of the contract, and that's a concept which I, we're going to come on to a bit, a bit later, but it does impact the party's ability to perform. And these clauses usually contain a non-exhaustive list of events, which are considered force majeure events, um, and they will explain the consequences of such events. So, um, you know, where Isabel was talking about how under French law, um, there's a sort of regime as to um, what happens uh, in the event of force majeure, whether, whether it's termination or suspension. And um, again, under English law, the clause is king and it tells you what happens. Um, and the clause may either provide for cancellation of the contract um, or suspension of the party's ability to liability to perform for the period that the force majeure event endures um, and then of course there's the intermediate where a clause provides for suspension for x period of time and then if that time is surpassed then you can cancel the contract um, but it will all be set the regime will be set out in the clause thank you Isabel, a fairly high profile case in France recently dealt with these concepts. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that case and, and other developments? Yes, um, that was a, a, a case involving EDF, uh, the uh, electricity, uh, electricity uh, public company. Um, and the, the contract uh, involved uh, in that case was a, con a contract for the purchase of electricity between EDF on the one side and Total Energy uh, uh, on the other side. And what, what happened is that um, basically Total Energy was to purchase uh, electricity on the, uh, that, that contract for a minimum of quantity every uh, month. And uh, when uh, the lockdown was decided, uh, um, Total Energy wrote uh, to EDF saying, well, uh, sorry, uh, but uh, based on force majeure, uh, uh, I cannot purchase that electricity. Um, and I want the performance of the contract to be uh, suspended. EDF refused and the matter went to uh, the French courts. Um, in emergency proceedings, that's um, referé in French, and that means basically that uh, if there is an urgency to rule on a case, then you can seize the French court in order to uh, get a ruling as quickly as possible. So that's what Total Energy did uh, by going to the French court. And uh, the commercial court of Paris, confirmed by um, the Court of Appeal of Paris, decided that there was an event of Fox Majeure in this case. And uh, I, I think it is um, quite uh, notable because that was the first case referring back to COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, and uh, the Fox Majeure uh, was recognized. The one specific feature that I should probably mention is that in this case, there was a Fox Majeure clause in the contract and um, the, the force measure clause refers back to the, the, the features that I mentioned earlier, which are in the legal definition of the uh, civil code, but also uh, to the reasonable economic circumstances. And it was a way of qualifying the legal definition uh, through the um, reasonable economic circumstances and it may well be the case that it is because of that reference in the clause, which was uh, an amendment 
in a way, to the legal definition, uh, it, it may well be the case that the French courts decided that there was force majeure as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic because of that reference, because uh, the French courts look at the event and the specific uh, features uh, and determine as to whether or not uh, those um, features of force majeure were uh, satisfied in the light of the reasonable economic circumstances. And here, that was a way of giving some leeway to the French court uh, in order to decide whether or not there was uh, force majeure. And what was looked at is that performance of the contract um, has led to uh, significant losses for total energy. And that's on that basis uh, that the French court decided that uh, there was force majeure. So it may be a specific case simply because of the flows in the contract. That's very interesting. Um, Naomi, English courts and French courts love to disagree. It's almost like a national sport. How, how do you think this case would have come down in England? Or if you can tell us other developments about how a court would look at a case like this, sort of a step-by-step -step analysis, I think that would be very useful. Um, yeah, well, as I mentioned, um, it would be that the English courts would uh, construe, uh, would, would take the approach of construing the clause in the contract. Um, and as as uh, Isabel said, in, in, in this case, um, for the French courts, actually, the terms of the contract were extremely important. And so perhaps um, the outcome in the U English courts wouldn't have been um, vastly different. I'm not aware of any force majeure case that has come before the English courts in a COVID context yet. Um, if a party would want to rely on a force majeure clause in the context of COVID, then it would come down to the wording um, of the contract. Um, I mean, under English law, that because a force majeure clause is, is construed as an exceptions clause, um, so you know, it provides an exception to a party's breach of contract, um, Therefore, it's construed restrictively. That's the sort of general rule, um, which would mean that, you know, uh, most of the time it's quite difficult to rely on these clauses. Um, when courts look at these clauses, they take a step by step approach. And there's likely to be three main points that they'll consider. Um, the first is whether um, the relevant event, in this case, COVID, would be a, uh, an FM event. Um, whether the event has caused interference in um, performance and then have the relevant formalities under the contract um, been complied with. Um, so looking a bit more closely at each of those, um, as regards whether or not their uh, COVID would be construed as an FM event, the clause usually contains a list of events and, and what would, you'd need to do is establish that COVID falls within that list. Um, sometimes in clauses, one sees reference to epidemics or pandemics, then you'd have thought that it'd be relatively straightforward. Um, but it's not super common to see that language. Um, an act of God is something that often crops up in the list. Um, and that's been defined in various cases before the English courts. It's usually construed as something that um, has such a direct and violent and sudden and irresistible, uh, well, a direct, violent and sudden irresistible act of nature, such that the defendant could not by any amount of ability foresee what would happen. Or if he could see that it would happen, he couldn't have avoided it. Um, and, but the phrase has generally been construed to apply to natural disasters like floods and earthquakes. Um, it hasn't, as far as I'm aware, been applied to in a pandemic context. Um, it's arguable that a pandemic could be construed as a, nat a natural disaster, um, but I can also see an argument against it. Um, if a clause doesn't have a list in it at all of events, um, it will usually refer to uh, any events that are beyond the reasonable control of a party. Um, it may be possible to argue that COVID falls within that kind of um, that kind of clause. Um, if there's no, if there's a list that has a lot of different events, but COVID doesn't look like it falls in it, but it's not exhaustive and it has something at the end of it like 
um, and all other events which are outside the reasonable control of a party, then there's no requirement to construe the list of events as um, justem generis, but the list will be looked at to construe the meaning of what an event is within someone's reasonable control. So, it, you know, it's all a matter of construction. Um, as I said, the next point courts will look at is in um, is really causation. Sorry, some a telephone call just popped up on my screen. Um, and uh, the court, you you generally have to show that the event, the F FM event, caused non-performance um, in in the circumstances, um, and uh, that the relevant party would not not have performed. Um, even if the event hadn't taken place um, and couldn't have taken reasonable steps to avoid or mitigate the event. Um, as to the degree of non-performance that you have to achieve, that it's, it's generally necessary to show that as a result of the event of non-performance, uh, the event performance has become physically or legally impossible and not just um, difficult or unprofitable. Um, and in, in that way, it's sort of... Um, where you have that absolute impossibility of performance, then um, the clauses reflect what I now understand is under uh, the position under French law. So if you have a, you know, a supply of goods scenario, it wouldn't be a, an excuse not to supply the goods just because the place where the goods are sourced has put down an embargo on um, export of the goods because of COVID, for example. Um, and, and so it became much more expensive for you to get the goods from get the goods because you had to look to another source, that wouldn't generally qualify um, as a force majeure scenario. Um, but again, it will come down to the wording of the contract. So some, some contracts don't provide for performance having been prevented, but they just require performance to have been hindered or delayed. In those circumstances, the threshold is lower. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, there are more scenarios which would fall within the clause. Um, and the last point I mentioned is that you have to um, look carefully at the note of, well, the formalities of the clause. Lots of um, force majeure clauses typically provide for notification procedures. Um, if those notification procedures are construed as conditions to the contract, then um, if one doesn't follow them, then you will be precluded from relying on the force majeure clause. If they're construed as merely intermediate terms, um, then um, you don't, you should comply with them. But if you don't comply with them, you can still rely on uh, force majeure, but you might be liable in damages um, if your failure to notify uh, resulted in loss for the other party. And deciding whether or not a um, a notification procedure is a condition or an inter in, in, in intermediate term, it's a construction matter. Um, more often than not, if a clause is very specific as to the notification procedure, it has a specific time frame um, for notification or makes notification of the essence, then it will be construed as, as a condition. If it's a bit vaguer than that, then um, it, can be, it will be looked at as a, a, an indeterminate term, uh, sorry, an intermediate term. And so that's the that's the general approach that the courts would go through um, if they're faced with a COVID situation. But as I said, um, I don't think the courts have considered yet uh, any clause in a in a COVID in a COVID situation. Great. So one one point to pick up on one point that all three of you have mentioned, and that's really sort of at the core of this notion of the, the party's assumptions having failed, is the notion of unforeseeability. Uh, now we've we've gone through the first wave of COVID, and arguably there is a second wave uh, coming up that's already uh, manifesting itself in, in some parts of the world. How does that impact, if at all, the legal analysis of these types of force majeure clauses? And, and maybe I'll ask uh, Naomi and, and Katarina to just uh, briefly touch upon that sequentially. Um, I'm going to get very boring on English law. It, um, it's going to come down to what the, I mean, in the first instance, what the uh, what the contract says. Um, so, in you know, un, many clauses, force majeure clauses that you see in contracts governed by English law exclude foreseeable events. And in those cases, um, if a contract was entered into after the developments in Wuhan became public knowledge, then there's going to there, there could well be a problem for somebody seeking to rely on a force majeure 
clause um, on the basis of COVID. If a contract doesn't exclude foreseeable events, um, the position at English law as to whether contracts, as to whether clauses should be construed as excluding foreseeable, uh, sorry, foreseeable events is uncertain. Um, and judges have taken different views on the issue. Um, and, and, you know, that could be a point which is played out in, in future cases. Um, one thing is clear though, and that's assuming a foreseeable event can be a force majeure event. Um, if the event is more foreseeable at the time uh, the contract was concluded, then it's more likely to have been reasonable for you to have taken steps to mitigate the effect of the event. Um, and so actually, it might be that we you look at it as part of a causation issue and you say, well, actually, um, the event here hasn't caused the the um, performance issue because this is something that could have been avoided. Katharina, any 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 thoughts from a civil law perspective or more generally? Um, well, well, yes, I, I think that um, uh, that uh, of course we are talking about contracts that in. in into uh, that were entered into before March uh, to 2020, and I think that time uh, and the passing of time has actually an impact on future claims. Um, the same legal issue may have different answers depending on the date on which the problem occurred, before or after the world. Health Organization Declaration of Mars uh, 11. Um, and, and in case uh, the affected uh, uh, party has to prove um, uh, adequate causation between the pandemic and the impossibility to, to, to perform, I think that um, this is perhaps the, 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 the most uh, difficult aspect to, to tackle right now. I mean, I think that the, the, the issue is not that much about foreseeability, but uh, about adequate causation. And sometimes I think that we are dealing with situations in which the impact on, on performance is not clear. And in some other cases, the, the obstacles preventing performance could have been removed, although, of course, with, with, with extra costs. And in those cases, the question uh, is uh, whether, uh, whether the civil codes uh, in, in, in civil law uh, countries uh, set for a criteria uh, for regarding reasonable uh, reasonable efforts or uh, or regarding uh, reasonable costs. And for instance, the, the Portuguese, the, the Angolan and the Mozambican and the Brazilian law do not expressly state that the affected party is obliged to mitigate damages and to prevent escalation of adverse effects. However, such, such mitigation efforts are considered to be a collateral duty imposed by, by, by good faith. Um, uh, what uh, what uh, Naomi called in English law the uh, intermediate terms, uh, for us those are collateral duties imposed by, by good faith. So the major issue here concerns the measure of, of such efforts. And, and also um, regarding possibility, I think that we we may find here a difference as well. Um, in most Lusophone jurisdiction, the idea of force majeure is based upon the concept of uh, inevitability. Um, in Portugal, this has been confirmed by the Supreme Court of Justice. I also think that under the Unidroit principles and under the Vienna Convention on Contracts uh, for International Sales of Goods, a party can be exempted from liability for a failure to perform if the impediment is beyond control. So the magic word is control. Um, Regarding uh, the, 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 the problems that we, uh, we might face uh, during this second wave or after the second wave, uh, I think that, uh, that there is something that we should perhaps point out. 
Uh, in long-term uh, construction contracts, um, the owner's claims related to, to delay damages are often subject to specific guarantees. And of course, that when we are talking about delays, um, we can have a combination of, co of causes, uh, delay uh, that is imputable to the vector, and also delays caused by uh, COVID-19 contingencies and so on. And uh, those delay damages are often subject to specific guarantees. And depending on the type of guarantee, this can also raise problems in future litigations. I am thinking, for instance, of interim relief to prevent enforcement of bank guarantees. There are precedents in the Lusophone world granting relief in such cases, although, of course, I cannot say that this corresponds to the to the dominant position and uh, and I, I i certainly do not purport to um, uh, to know whether uh, courts are going to apply uh, to apply uh, uh, the same rule in covid-19 related cases but i think that that will be a problem uh, uh, during the second wave uh, of covid-19 cases which may also be a second wave of litigations. Guilherme. Obrigado, Catarina. So we're going to move ahead a little bit now to MAC clauses. And what we'll do is we'll start off with Naomi and then we'll, we'll uh, kick it off to, to Isabel to get an English and French law perspective on MAC clauses and what is, is playing out currently uh, with that trend. Thanks, Guy. Um, a MAC law, well, I thought I'd start with a bit of an introduction, um, just in case there are people out there who aren't um, so familiar with the term MAC laws. Um, MAC stands for Material Adverse Change, and there are also Material Adverse Effect clauses. And these types of clauses are usually found in um, loan documentation, um, where they I think, Guy, you alluded to this in your intro, where they amount to an event of default or a trigger for certain obligations of a borrower. Or in an M&A context, um, in an M&A SPA, where they're intended to provide an escape route for the buyer based on any deterioration of the target company between signing and completion. Um, so when you talking about uh, MAC clauses and um, MAE clauses in English contracts, a common banking clause will provide that an event of default will occur where there's an event which the majority of the lenders believe or has or is reason uh, believe has or is reasonably likely to have a material adverse effect. Um, and in that such a context, material adverse effect might be defined as something which in the reasonable opinion of the lenders um, has a material adverse effect on the business, its operations or financial condition. And that's, I mean, usually amongst other things. Um, in a uh, merger and acquisitions context in an SPA, you might see a clause which says something like, if anything um, occurs except uh, something caused by the seller, which is likely to have a material adverse effect on the financial condition, prospects or business of the company, um, the purchaser may elect not to complete the purchase. So those are types of clauses we're talking about. Um, and as ever under English law, each time uh, each clause will be construed on its own particular wording. Um, there's quite limited case law in English law on these types of clauses because um, they are generally construed restrictively. Um, there's quite with terms uh, like material. Um, they can be quite difficult to interpret. The burden of proof is on um, the person, the party invoking the clause, um, and the consequences for the party invoking can, uh, can be pretty drastic. So um, if you wrongly invoke um, a, you know, a, a, a MAC clause in a banking context, then um, you will be, could be held liable for repudiatory breach of the contract. Um, so on that basis, we've had very few cases, um, and um, and those cases that we have had have showed that the clauses are generally construed restrictively. However, we are starting to see some cases, um, uh, MAC-based cases, in in the COVID context. And there was um, a couple of weeks ago a, a judgment, albeit only a preliminary issues judgment, by the High Court 
in an um, M&A context on a MAC clause. Um, the case is called Travelport versus WEX. Uh, it's, I should say it's also currently on appeal. Um, it, uh, by way of background, WEX is a US-based company and it had agreed to buy um, two entities called Enet and Optal from another company called Travelport under an English law governed sale and purchase agreement that had been signed in January 2020. Um, Optal's business, so one of the subjects of the, of the acquisition, involved issuing virtual credit card account numbers um, that worked a little bit like physical credit cards um, that could be used by one business to pay and another business. Its principal client was Enet. Um, and Enet derived the vast majority of its profits from, from providing business to business payment services to customers who operated uh, in the travel industry, which obviously, as we all know, has been hit really hard by the pandemic. So material adverse um, event condition in the relevant SPA allowed WEX to pull out of the deal if any event had a material adverse effect on the business condition, financial or otherwise, or results of the operation of Enet and its subsidiaries taken as a whole, or of Optal and its subsidiaries taken as a whole. And then that clause, and this is sort of a typical, where, um, and that, you know, another typical style of clauses, you usually have um, a material adverse event clause and then you have carve outs from it. So this particular clause had a carve out for conditions resulting from pandemics. Great. But then it had another carve out, which said, um, except uh, where those uh, where the pandemic had a disproportionate effect on ENET and its subsidiaries taken as a whole, or on Optal and its subsidiaries also taken as a whole, as compared to other participants in the industries in which ENET, Optal or their respective subsidiaries operate. So the key word, oh, I mean, this was all going to come down to that second exception. Was there a disproportionate effect on um, Enet or Optal taken as a whole as compared with other participants in the industries in which they were operating? So, the, you know, the question for the court here really was what is industries in this in this sentence? And um, the buyer uh, sought to argue that industries had to be construed widely. So the entire business to business payments industry rather than the travel payments industry. Um, whereas the um, seller argued that um, actually, you, you know, this, the principal, uh, all the, the most of their money was being made in the travel industry. And there was a, a particular industry that related specifically to travel payments. Um, the court agreed with uh, with Wex. It concluded that um, the. Uh, they they interpreted the term as uh, as being wide, and so being the entire business to business payments industry, um, and uh, they concluded that the um, the pandemic had had a disproportionate effect on um, the targets as compared to other industry participants, and therefore um, and therefore reliance on the MAE clause was allowed. Um, and this, I think this, I mean, this case shows really that it does come down to the wording of the particular clause in any given case. Um, but unusually, it shows that sometimes perhaps a little bit of ambiguity in your clause might not be too problematic. Um, because, you know, if the if industry had been construed in, in, a, in a more precise way, it might not have been construed in favour um, of WEX in this case. Um, you know, having said that, that given that we, you know, when when people are entering into um, M&A deals right now, they can probably foresee that the pandemic is going to be an issue. One would have, one would generally advise a client to think very carefully about this type of clause to allow them to um, unwind their deal um, by having very specific wording. Carve outs from carve outs, the feast of litigators for sure. Uh, but let, let me just interject briefly before turning to Isabel. But um, that's that's a somewhat surprising result, I think. In the U.S., at least, Delaware and New York courts have construed MAC clauses very, very uh, restrictively. And it's really an uphill battle for buyers to successfully invoke them. And one of the reasons you say is, is obviously this typical carve out of industry wide or market wide events. And, and as far as I am aware, at least, there's no 
case law that's actually come out of COVID uh, regarding uh, uh, you know invocation of MAC clauses in COVID. Uh, there is this obviously some high profile deals that either fell through or that were renegotiated by the parties, the most notable of which is probably the LVMH and Tiffany's case. Uh, but that at least tends to show, I think, that the, the pandemic has such a uh, disproportionate impact on everybody generally that at least sellers and buyers are sort of willing to come together and to negotiate solutions. And that's happened in another uh, in a couple of other cases as well. Uh, Isabel, any any sort of French law or, or wider views on, on what uh, Naomi just commented? Sorry, I, I, I at least can't hear you. I don't know if others can hear you. Can you hear me yes. now? Okay, good. Uh, I should say that we have seen um, more and more contracts governed by French law with uh, MAC or MAE uh, clauses in M&A and finance uh, contracts. And that is actually a practice uh, that comes from common law jurisdictions. Um, but this is something that we see now quite, uh, quite uh, frequently. They are not regulated by the civil code apart from uh, the general principles of contract law. Uh, but uh, so there, there will be uh, really a matter of uh, the parties' negotiation, and then they would be submitted to general principles such as uh, parties must uh, negotiate and perform their contract um, in good faith, and all the rules applicable to interpretation of a contract would apply. Uh, but there is nothing specifically. Um, on, on, on the MAC clauses uh, in the civil code. And I haven't seen really um, a lot of uh, case law uh, on those uh, clauses, and uh, none uh, in particular in relation to the COVID-19, but even more broadly uh, in relation to um, situations of a pandemic, uh, such as uh, this one. I think that uh, if we want to compare uh, the MAC clauses with uh, other situations uh, or force majeure and what we have under French law, and prévision, something that we, we will talk about uh, later, I would say that it is probably closer to the concept of imprévision or hardship, uh, simply because we are talking about a change of circumstances um, that renders the performance of a contract uh, more onerous or more difficult. But there is a key difference between the two, the MAC uh, clauses and uh, the um, uh, hardship uh, clauses, is that hardship clauses would primarily le 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 um, give rise to, um, to a renegotiation of the contract, while uh, the MAC clauses would allow a party to get away from the deal, as uh, Naomi just explained. So I think this is a key difference, uh, and, and we'll, we'll come to that when we talk about imprévision and hardship uh, under French law and other uh, civil law uh, systems. But I think that that is a key uh, point, a key difference between the two. Uh, and, and again, I think that French courts would, would look at it, uh, would look at a contract with a, a MAC clause uh, on a case by case basis, uh, really, um, looking more specifically at the micro situation of that particular party rather than the big picture, uh, the social and economic big picture. So I, I think that that would probably be the approach of the French courts. So. We can't hear you. Oh, yeah, I have a, two layers of muting here, just for the security's sake. Uh, Catalina, can you tell us a little bit about how, uh, you know, the incorporation of these MAC clauses into civilian law type uh, contracts, uh, how that has been playing out in the loser phone world and how that interacts, uh, you know, potentially displacing or how it supplements uh, 
sort of these broader concepts, including the ones to which uh, Isabel uh, alluded to, like like good faith and like other limits on on sort of party autonomy uh, and, and, and doctrines of that sort. Yes, uh, thank you again, Guillermo. Um, well, I, I think that um, uh, that um, uh, the question uh, uh, we have uh, in in, in uh, for instance, in Brazil and in, in Angola and Mozambique, is uh, whether uh, whether the case is or is not covered by uh, by the the MAC clause. And, and of course, to to uh, to uh, to to clarify this and to clarify the the party's choice regarding risk allocation, uh, we have to interpret the contract. And, and, and as you know, this, this task can be quite demanding because often uh, material adverse change clauses have uh, a three-step structure, uh, rule, carve out, carve right back. And this is not uh, 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 this is not uh, uh, an easy uh, an, an easy uh, task to to uh, to to perform uh, to 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 interpret a, a contract which uh, imports a clause from an Anglo-Saxon world and at the same time uh, has uh, such a difficult uh, uh, structure. But um, if I may keep it uh, simple, I will assume that we have uh, a case that it is that is not included in a material adverse change clause. And, uh, and then, as you know, um, good faith uh, is a traditional foundation of private law in many civil law countries. And we may ask ourselves nowadays, what is good faith? Uh, and, and, and good faith can imply uh, many things, can imply additional duties or collateral obligations, can imply limitations to exercise of rights, can imply uh, limitations to waivers of rights, can imply rights to renegotiation of contracts and eventually can imply rights to claim for modification of contracts. This is a broad scope of application that 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 limits the the parties' freedom in 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 commercial uh, contracts. And besides, uh, uh, in, in these countries, uh, good faith uh, is like a, a multi-purpose remedy, meaning it can be invoked as an objection to enforcement. It can be used uh, to ground claims for damages. It can be used to correct contracts. And in some civil law countries, courts and scholars consider that the parties cannot simply exclude nor adjust remedies imposed by good faith. If we follow these steps, then material adverse change clauses cannot be regarded as an exclusive remedy to material adverse changes. In case of doubt, if the contract is not clear about the, the risk allocation, good faith would enable courts to police the terms of the contract. And this can have uh, implications in post m &A disputes, particularly when the parties have agreed on completion accounts mechanisms to determine the price. And for a long time, limits uh, uh, to good faith were not called into question. However, uh, I think that if we look closer, we can observe a, a subtle and, and slow-moving trend towards uh, private autonomy uh, and, and commercial certainty uh, in civil law countries. And we can perceive this in, in the recent changes to the Brazilian Civil Code introduced by the Economic Freedom Law in 2019. And if we follow this tendency towards uh, private autonomy, we may accept that the reaction to material adverse changes is strictly limited to the terms of the clause. Um, we may accept, uh, as Naomi uh, said, that the party's bargain is king. And that would be quite a revolution in, in, in civil law countries. Of course, then, 
that then the discussion will be concentrated on interpretation problems in which, again, good faith plays a very important uh, role. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, we do not know if, if this trend towards private autonomy is at risk of being reversed as a reaction to the pandemic. I do not think that, that, that I am biased towards absolute freedom of choice by, by the parties, but I, I do believe that if we simply open the door to modifications of contracts without thorough analysis of the facts and uh, of the boundaries of good faith itself, we may be creating a, a second layer of uh, economic turbulence. Uh, and of course, that, that would be a major concern, uh, both for, for, for lawyers and, 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 and of course, for, for businessmen. That's a very interesting point. And what I'll do is there is a, a question from uh, the audience. Well, in fact, one of the organizers, Andre Luis Montero, who is a good friend, uh, he asks, and his question is directly mostly to Naomi. Um, his question is essentially about the role of English law in the pandemic. We've seen with Catalina that perhaps the civil law world was trending towards a sort of more four corners of the page uh, approach to, to these commercial transactions. But of course, the, as we have been talking about, and as we see in the real world, the pandemic has flipped a lot of things upside down. And so there's also sort of the converse movement of perhaps parties are really sort of unable to anticipate a lot of these uh, events that are happening now. And some of them may feel like, you know, with, you know, when they were bargaining, they couldn't, they essentially couldn't foresee these events. And yet, you know, their force majeure clauses may be fall short, uh, despite the best efforts of the draftsman. Do, do you think English law is, is, is perhaps trending in the other direction to, and there's somewhat of a convergence between civil law and, and, and common law? towards a, a balanced approach, say, or, or are we still sort of very much focused on the bargain is king as, as a principle? Um, I think we're still very much focused on the bargain is king um, as a principle. Um, I mean, we don't have enough case law in the COVID context to show, to, 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 to be able to say, oh, well, English law is making a specific exception for um, this event, but it would be very, very unlikely. I mean, it would go against kind of all um, the way that English law has been developing forever. Um, and we're going to come on, I think, to talk about the only exception to the bargain is king um, rule uh, in this type of context shortly, frustration. Um, and, you know, as we'll discuss, it's extremely restrictive um, and I can't see it being broadened um, in, in a pandemic context. Great. Um, so now, and this seems like a perfect segue actually into our final uh, sort of subsection uh, for today, which is on the one side, the hardship type doctrines that are perhaps typical to civil law system and uh, frustration and taxability as they rise in, in, in the common law world. Uh, let me uh, start off with Katarina. Uh, if you can give us a brief primer on, again, sort of just just an overview of these hardship type doctrines, uh, you know, both in the Germanic type tradition and uh, in, in other traditions that affect the Lusophone world, before we then go to Isabel to talk about the, the novelish uh, 1195, uh, Article 1195 of the French uh, Civil Code. So Katarina, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, I think that you have noticed that I really like uh, the matters that we are discussing. So I'm sorry if sometimes I, <laughs> I um, well, um, but I mean, I cannot, I cannot, uh, that, that's something I cannot help. Um, um, well, uh, regarding hardship, I think that uh, it is quite, quite, quite common to say that, that civil lawyers are, are familiar with the concept of modifying a contract. Um, but in, in my opinion, uh, it is also true that some are more familiar than, 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 than others. And, and uh, if, if the contract is, is silent on hardship, uh, the question will be answered by the law governing the agreement uh, 
can bind or not with international trade usage. We have not talked about international trade usage, but uh, this can also play an important role. And, and again, using comparative law too, um, we become aware of a clear contrast between uh, Italian law and, and, and German law. Um, and in Italy, the, the legal provision deals with cases of excessively burdensome performance. Um, under the Italian civil code, long-term contracts might be terminated if exceptional and unforeseeable uh, events occurred during the duration of the contract, making one of the parties' performance excessively burdensome with respect to the uh, original contractual balance. In contrast, uh, the, the German civil code comprises uh, a broader provision reflecting uh, a doctrine originally uh, developed by the court, the court which is called uh, the, the doctrine of the disappearance of the basis of the contracts. And the German provision uh, encompasses not only cases of hardship, but also cases of frustration of implied assumptions and certain cases of frustration of purpose. In civil law countries, following a broader concept of change of circumstances, the first line of cases involve supervenient disproportion between performance and counter-performance. Then the second line of cases corresponds to the situations or to certain situations um, of frustration of purpose. Of course, there, there are borderline cases uh, of frustration of purpose uh, um, um, uh, uh, and the lines are impossibility to perform and change of circumstances. The third line of cases um, uh, corresponds to, uh, as I said before, frustration of implied assumptions. And perhaps a fourth line of cases uh, uh, includes, uh, perhaps no, eventually a fourth line of cases includes uh, hardship cases. Uh, and on what these cases have uh, in common is that they relate to good faith and they relate to this concept of the basis of the transaction. Uh, the UNITRA principles often regarded as a useful restatement of, of, of the Lex Mercatoria uh, only refer to hardship and consider that there is hardship where the occurrence um, uh, of events fundamentally uh, alter the equilibrium of, of the contracts. So uh, we, we have different, different uh, perspectives within, uh, within um, uh, uh, civil law countries, even excluding uh, 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 French law, of course, I, I would not uh, purport to, to, to even to say a word um, with Isabel uh, on this panel. Uh, uh, a question that I think that we have to ask is uh, what are the effects of hardship or of change of circumstances? And again, the consequences also differ. In Italy, the effect of excessive difficulty uh, is termination of contracts, whereas in Germany, the affected party uh, is also granted the right to modify the contract. And it is undeniable that the doctrine of the basis of transaction in Germany empowers courts and tribunals to correct contracts and to allocate the risks of unforeseen circumstances. In countries following the German tradition, it is debatable whether there is another of the consequences and whether the preferred consequence is modification. Also in those countries, it is controversial whether good faith imposes a duty to renegotiate a contract before resorting to claims for modification based upon change of, of circumstances. These two models, the Italian model and, and, and the, the, the German model, are, are, are relevant. Uh, 
if we consider, for instance, again, um, and I'm sorry about that, the Luciferon world, uh, Portuguese uh, and Golden Mozambican codes contain regulations inspired by the German doctrine, whereas Brazil follows the Italian model. And, and this is just about the law. And we cannot forget, of course, case law. And when it comes to court decisions, quite quite surprisingly, in Portugal, in Angola, and in Mozambique, court decisions tend to dismiss claims based on change of circumstances, setting the bar high. Uh, while in Brazil, uh, courts seem to leave more room uh, for for interventions uh, and for. Uh, and for um, uh, and for uh, termination of, of of contracts. So uh, again, uh, I am um, I am trying to use uh, a, a comparative law as a as a resourceful tool to to handle the difficult cases and the difficult uh, situations we will be tackling during the the the, the, the next month. And thank you again for 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 your time and 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 for um, and I'm sorry for my enthusiasm when I talk about comparative law. <laughs> your enthusiasm is what keeps us going, Katarina. Um, Isabel, uh, obviously French law has a very rich history of of sort of hardship doctrines going all the way back, of course, to 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 the state council and administrative law. Can you tell us a little bit about what you know, what the state of the law is today and what you've seen in the context of the pandemic, including, you know, attempts to renegotiate or rebalance contracts. That uh, there, there is a, a history in administrative law, uh, in public law, uh, because interestingly, um, it was not possible uh, to have uh, our chip um, in private law contracts unless you had a specific hardship clause in the contract, uh, but that was the only exception. But now with the uh, 2016 uh, reform of, of the contract law, there is now a specific provision in uh, the civil code, uh, uh, which is article 1195 of the civil code, which uh, creates this uh, imprevision hardship uh, defense which is now available for private uh, law contracts. And it goes like this. If a change of circumstances, which was unforeseeable at the time of the conclusion of the contract, renders performance of the contract is excessively onerous for a party who did not undertake to bear the risk, that party may ask the other party to renegotiate the contract. The first party must continue to perform his obligations during renegotiation. So that's quite interesting because, of course, um, that was something which uh, had been tried again and again in private law uh, and successfully uh, when there was no contract, uh, closed archive contract in the contract. But um, now this is possible. Uh, I, I should probably say that there are two limitations. Uh, to that uh, imprevision outshed defense, which is now in the civil code. The first is that it should only apply to the contracts entered into uh, from 1st of October 2016. Although here, just um, uh, some qualification, because there is a recent uh, decision by the Paris Court of Appeal of January 2020, um, which has decided to apply that uh, hardship defense, even though there was no clause in the contract and it was a contract entered into before the 1st of October. So we can see already that the French courts are ready to move on and uh, apply these um, hardship and prevision defense, even though we are, uh, they are dealing with a contract entered into before uh, the 1st of October, 2016. And the second limitation is that um, that uh, hardship um, uh, defense does not apply to some specific contracts, for instance, 
the um, sell um, the, the sell of financial bonds or instruments. Um, that is a, a there is a specific exclusion there, which is in the monetary and financial code. It's not possible to include in those kind of uh, contracts uh, a hardship uh, clause. Again, uh, the hardship provisions, which are now um, in the civil code, are uh, not mandatory. That means that the parties can deviate from those uh, provisions. Uh, they can even exclude hardship if they want. That is, again, uh, really a matter for the parties to negotiate. What I should uh, just um, say by way of summary about the uh, features of that uh, imprevision um, hardship uh, uh, in the French law is that so you need a change of circumstances that was unforeseeable at the time of conclusion of the contract to that change renders the performance of the contract excessively onerous and frankly here we don't have much case law and i uh, would suspect that it will be um uh, it will lead to some uncertainty as to how french court will apply that test because of course uh by excessively onerous you could uh, probably put quite a lot in that so i think there will be some case law um which will not be entirely settled uh, for some time. And the third um, feature of uh, the imprevision hardship uh, defense, which is now in the civil code, is that the party relying on hardship did not contractually um, undertake to bear the risk of this change in circumstances. And of course, that goes back to how the parties uh, negotiated uh, their contract in the first place. Uh, as to um, the effects of the uh, hardship and prevision defense uh, now in the civil code, uh, I think that um, that was mentioned uh, earlier uh, by, um, by uh, Katarina. The main effect of that new um, uh, defense uh, in, in the civil code is that the party will seek to renegotiate the contract. So it's not to get away from the contract, it's really to renegotiate uh, the contract. And I think that here you, you've got two uh, situation, uh, situations. One, the other side, the other party does not want to renegotiate, and that's the end of it. Uh, uh, two, the renegotiation takes place but fails. And in that case, uh, the matter uh, can go to the court. And here, what the court can do, um, it is more doctrine that case law, but what the uh, court uh, or, or the arbitral tribunal applying the relevant uh, law, so French law, would be able to do either the uh, modification of the contract or the adjustment of the contract or terminate the contract. Those are the two um, possibilities that a court or an arbitral tribunal could have uh, in case of disagreement by the parties. And uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is no case law in relation to COVID-19. But again, that's also a very uh, new uh, provision um, in, in the civil code. So uh, even uh, irrespective of the COVID-19, there is not much uh, case law anyway. Thank you. Um, so for our final, I think, point, uh, we will talk about sort of the common law view on these uh, types of doctrines. Um, before turning it over to, to Naomi, let me just say that impracticability on the uh, US law, it's codified in the Uniform Commercial Code. It's a little bit similar to these hardship doctrines, except that it doesn't really lead to, to renegotiations unless you actually have a hardship clause that imposes that. But it does have some of the same elements and, and a little bit of the same feel. Uh, but the effects, again, will, will be different. And even though courts and tribunals will generally try to um, act in a sort of equitable manner and, and will treat contracts, say, as divisible contracts, which might in the end have an effect somewhat similar to a rebalancing of the bargain. 
Uh, but English law, I understand, to be an even more restrictive, perhaps, uh, Naomi, and in particular with the doctrine of frustration. Uh, can you can you tell us? I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time, but if you can sort of synthesize it very quickly, uh, I'm sure we would all appreciate that. Yes, absolutely. I'm just going to correct one point I, I made earlier. So I think I misspoke on WEX. Um, so the case we were dealing with that dealt with um, material adverse effect clause, um, that was a preliminary judgment. And so WEX hasn't been released from uh, its obligations yet. It was the court's interpretation of a clause as a preliminary issue. Uh, and that interpretation is now on appeal and the case has not yet been decided. So I um, just wanted to set the record straight on that for everybody. Um, but turning back to frustration, um, or sorry, sorry, turning back to this discussion, as you say, we don't have this concept of hardship in um, in English law. Um, we have got um, one sort of escape route from the um, from the party's contractual bargain, but because the contract is king, it's extremely restrictive. Um, so, and it will only take place um, where event an event supervenes, which is so significantly changes the nature of contractual rights or obligations um, from what could have been contemplated at the time a contract was entered into, such that it would be unjust to hold them to the literal sense of the stipulations. And, you know, in those circumstances, a party is discharged from performance. But um, as I said, it's construed very narrowly. So it can't be just that it's more onerous to perform or even kind of um, it greatly more onerous or the phrase that um, Isabel was talking about in, in French law. Um, it certainly can't be more expensive to perform. It has to be essentially incapable of performance. So. Um, examples of the types of cases where we've seen um, frustration play out or where um, there's been destruction by fire of the subject matter of the contract or the subject matter of the contract is unavailable to, for performance. So, you know, where an opera singer is due to sing on the first night and can't um, and can't sing th through due to illness and that first night is essential to the contract, then you might have frustration. Um, or you have cancellation of an event where the whole purpose of the contract was to um, view the events. And we've got um, a sort of couple of cases that are uh, relate to the coronation of, or the postponement of King Edward VII's coronation due to his illness um, that are, the fam are very famous for dealing with frustration. Um, but the, the, you know the fact that we hark back to cases at the turn of the of the of the of the twentieth century perhaps indicates how um, how the doctrine hasn't really evolved and how restrictive it is. And um, there's certainly no case law in a COVID context, um, but it's uh, sure that it's unlikely to be a a frustrating event in and of itself. But it could give rise to frustration, um, for example, where there's you know on the basis of illness uh, on a huge scale, it's their insufficient staff or raw materials or transport to perform a contract. That's where you could sort of see frustration potentially playing out. Um, a couple of just other points that you know, may be relevant to the, um, the application of frustration in a COVID context. Uh, one is timing. Um, you know, if a contract is, you're unable to perform a contract for a short period of time, um, uh, but the con uh, due to COVID, but actually the contract is due to run on for a very long period of time, then the contract's unlikely to be held to be frustrated just because it couldn't be performed for a short period. And we've seen cases from the US actually and from, um, and from Hong Kong in a uh, sort of pandemic-like situation, which um, one could imagine the English courts looking to. Um, the other point to note is that um, for contracts entered into after COVID, uh, was known about, it's going to be likely very difficult to argue that a contract would be frustrated because in considering whether there's frustration under English law, courts take into account um, parties' knowledge at the time of the contract, um, when they concluded the contract, when they're considering whether frustration occurred. And the more that a subsequent event was foreseeable or was in fact foreseen at the time of the contract, the less likely it could be regarded as frustrating because if the parties were aware of the risk of an event, they will or should have dealt with it in their contract and therefore the contract would be unlikely to be held to be frustrated. So as you can see, frustration is, is really very restrictive in English law. And there's um, the result of a frustration if you get there is that the contract's discharged, but we don't have this rebalancing uh, concept at all. Great, and and I think under under New York and American law more generally, I think that the approach that the approach is quite similar. Very restrictive. Courts will construe the purpose of the contract 
very broadly in order to say, well, that you know, this broad purpose hasn't been uh, frustrated. Um, so I, th I think that wraps up our panel. Uh, we hope this has been, uh, well, helpful, I suppose, but also uh, sort of joyful for you. Katharina's enthusiasm certainly certainly helped on that score. Uh, let me just, there's, there's one announcement that I'm supposed to make, which is, uh, I believe, and, and, if, and if it's not there, it's not my fault, but I think there's a link uh, under the, the, the video, uh, the, the bottom of your screen, and that should take you to the link for the next panel, uh, which I understand will start in about uh, a quarter of an hour. It's been a real pleasure to, to moderate the panel. I want to thank our panelists again. I want to thank the organizers and sponsors for setting up this great event. And we look forward to, to at some point, seeing everybody in person again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.